Thank you. Thank you. One person giving me a powerful round of applause. And the rest. I'm Alec Baldwin, and it is my pleasure to kick off the Hamptons Institute series tonight. The Institute was founded in 2010 by the late Mickey Strauss and has been one of Guildhall's most successful programs. Its purpose is to foster values-based leadership and to provide a neutral and balanced venue for discussing critical issues that define a democratic society. Over the next three weeks, we will continue the dialogue with discussions on climate change, which is tonight. President Trump and the Constitution, which is our panel with uh, uh, Michael Klarman. And uh, who was our other panelist? Someone yelled to me. Jeffrey, Jeffrey who said that? Thank you, so Jeffrey Rosen's sister is over here right now. <laughs> Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, they'll be here with us next Monday the 14th to discuss Trump and the Constitution. And then our final panel on the 21st is uh, I think it's called, uh, don't tell me, don't tell me. Um, I think it's called uh, uh, um, uh, The New Normal in News, Ideology versus Fact, The New Normal in News. Thank you, that's <clears throat> uh, my agent. Um, we are delighted that three renowned experts in climate change, representing the intersection of science, policy, and activism, have joined us tonight. And, and I want to also thank uh, Andrea Grover and everybody from Guild Hall for helping us put this together. The Hamptons Institute is something that lapsed for a period of time and we brought it back last year. Very successful, we had three wonderful programs last year. And this year we have three wonderful programs again. To have these folks come and join us uh, is really uh, our good fortune. And we have a wonderful panel with Michael Klarman and Mr. Rosen and the, uh, and the panel for the fake news, as they say. Our panelists tonight are Ria Su, the president of the National Natural Resources Defense Council. Alex Soros, the founder of the Alexander Soros Foundation. Naomi Oreskes, the professor of history, the professor of the history of science and affiliated professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard University. And our moderator tonight is uh, our own, uh, David Rattray, the editor of the East Hampton Star. Please welcome our panelists. Good evening. I'm David Rattray, and um, it is a pleasure to be here tonight to take on this subject. Um, and it's nice to see a, a, a good house is interested in this, because sometimes it seems like climate science for all the front page stories, thank you, failing New York Times today, by the way, major story, um, you know, uh, attention somehow is not paid in many ways. And I think here on eastern Long Island, we're a hundred miles out into the Atlantic, sitting on a sand spit. And if any impact of climate change will be felt on the eastern United States, it's going to be from sea level rise and storms that come in just a little bit higher and claw away at all of our ocean front. Um, and so you sort of wonder whether uh, this is a moment where self-interest begins to kick in and um, so I kind of thought as a starting point, you know, to ask what it takes to bridge the disconnect between what we know about climate change and what we do as individuals, government leaders. Um, I know a few Professor Oreskes want to talk a little bit about the disconnect that you see in, in American culture in particular. This is no longer a scientific question, is it? This is really a question of policy and a question of us as individuals, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, first of all, for inviting me here tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. So absolutely, I just came back from six weeks traveling around the world, and one of the most notable things you see when you go overseas is that everywhere else, from small villages in Tanzania to Paris to Rio de Janeiro, all around the world, people know the climate is changing, people accept the scientific evidence, people think this is a serious problem, and people are starting to do things about it. And you come here... And it's like going through some weird Twilight Zone episode, you know? Um, so that disconnect is real, and I think it's one of the challenges we faced is to try to figure out how to fix that. Now, um, 
Alex, one of your roles with the, the Alexander Soros Foundation is in grassroots activism. And um, I wonder in your travels what you've seen and what, and what you observe about people and their commitment to fighting climate change and where individual action plays a role. Thank you, and, and it's an, an honor to be here. Um, I'll just say that um, I'm not an expert uh, on, uh, on climate change, uh, but I like to think of myself as somebody who supports uh, people that um, uh, are on the front lines um, protecting uh, the environment and uh, that my role is to amplify um, their voice, and that's actually um, how Alec um, and I um, uh, came to, to know each other was through uh, one of these uh, causes. Um, and, um, you know, for me, I think it's actually, it's a, you know, we have the data, we have the science, it's oftentimes too abstract uh, for people. It was, you know, too abstract for me, too. Uh, and I'm a PhD student, not trying to say that I'm smart or anything, but just, um, just putting it out there. Um, and, uh, um, it, you know, no, but, but, but that there was a serious, you know, serious problem, which was, okay, who's out there speaking about climate change? Okay, it's Al Gore, it's, you know, it's first world actors and actual actors like Leonardo DiCaprio, no offense to Alec again. Um, and, it, but it's not the people whose voices are the ones that really need, we really need to be um, listening to, because when you think of movements, and I believe that uh, issues around climate change need to foster themselves in some sort of a movement um, for change, you don't necessarily put a face on that movement because it's the environment and it's complicated and emissions are complicated and carbon is complicated. Um, but if we could simplify the issue um, and amplify the heroes that are on the front lines each day fighting um, the, uh, the encroachment of their land um, or the, um, you know, desecration of their, um, of their villages, that we would be doing uh, a great service to the, to, the, you know, to the general population to show that this is a human issue. Because when you think of the civil rights movement, you think of Martin Luther King, you think of Rosa Parks, you think of actual people. When you think of suffragism, you think, you think of the, the suffragists, it would be Anthony, et cetera. You think of people, you see a face. And um, if I want to do anything, I just want to be able to show the faces and let them speak for themselves. So it's interesting you mentioned Al Gore. I mean, in some ways, he's sort of the, the poster boy for fighting climate change. And I, and I wonder, for an organization like the, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, you know, sort of how you see the problem and whether... Um, perhaps too much attention is wrapped up in, a, in an individual like that, and it makes it difficult perhaps to get a message across of self-interest because it seems some, somewhat abstract. I think it's important to, for us as a, as a group tonight to sort of define the problem. What, what is climate change mean today, and what, as, as you've d done, uh, what does it mean in the future? So um, there are so many juicy threads to try to pick up on um, with this conversation. And let me just uh, also uh, thank uh, the host for inviting us tonight. This is an incredibly august panel to be a part of. Um, you know, I guess I would actually argue with the frame of the conversation that, um, I mean, look, I, you do not have to convince me or uh, tell me how bad things are, um, particularly for climate change, but generally for environmental issues. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the head of a big environmental organization that's been around for almost 50 years, and I can unequivocally say this is the worst we've ever seen it. Um, and that's not hyperbole, that's fact, and I can unfortunately go through the various um, and several dozens of actions that this administration has already taken Taken, not just in basically wiping off uh, the face of uh, the federal map, uh, all of the progress that we've been able to make on climate policy, but certainly um, the very disturbing signs that we're seeing also from the legislative branch, from Congress, um, those represent twin threats that um, we've had in the past, but I don't think we've had, that, had it quite uh, at this level of magnitude. So again, don't get me wrong, um, I'm not Pollyannish about the reality of what we face. That being said, said, 
I do think that most Americans believe in climate change. I mean, if you look at public opinion polls, even with Republican voters, um, over 60% recognize that climate change is real and that it's man-made. That's more than certainly their elected officials are willing to admit um, or to make any action on. But I actually think, again, the people are on our side. And regardless of what's happening on the federal front, there's really interesting things happening on the local and state fronts. So just since the election, just since November, um, five states, and these are not the kind of typical states. I mean, granted, California just renewed um, their, their um, uh, climate aspirations legislatively. New York also is leaning in pretty considerably. But it's not just California and New York. It's Illinois, it's Michigan, and it's Ohio, it's Nevada, it's Colorado. It's the purple and the red states that are in between that are also signing up for clean energy progress. And you wanna know why? Because it makes sense for families, it makes sense for the economy, and those governors, those legislatures, wanna take advantage of the opportunity that is right before us. So I don't think that we are actually as kind of separated from the opportunity and the reality that, that again, the, the federal administration would like us to believe we are, I think we're actually continuing to make progress regardless of the man that's in the White House. So what do you think is motivating the, pro the progress uh, as a panel? I mean, it, it seems to me that a sort of uh, climate denial is a very powerful threat in contemporary American thought. It may be a minority position, increasingly, as, as you say, um, people do believe in human-caused climate change, and yet uh, opposition to regulation is, is something that finds very fertile ground, whether it's here in East Hampton or, or um, Nebraska or wherever it is. Um, you know, what, what do you, it doesn't seem to me like that, dis, that gap is being bridged certainly not at a national level, but even at a local level here in East Hampton, you do get the sense that there is reflexive opposition to an imp imposition perhaps on individual freedom. Yeah, well, I, I can speak to this too. So this is another example of the disconnect because a lot of Americans don't realize that around the world there's an energy revolution going on, and it is actually incredible what's happening in many places. Um, I met some folks from India recently who are developing a plan for offshore wind tied to compressed air storage. I mean, who in the United States has even heard about this? Compressed air storage is such a brilliant idea because it's totally non-toxic. If the pipe leaks, air goes back to the atmosphere, right? So, and that's just one example. And these things are happening all over the world. But the key thing that's driving it in many places are smart policies. So in California, the Renewable Energy Standard, AB 32, and California's long history of legislation to support energy efficiency, which makes it you know, one of the most robust states in America economically and one of the most energy efficient. So California long ago proved that the assumption that energy use and economic growth go together, it's false. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, so renewable portfolio standards in Germany, a set of regulatory standards and government policy that supported the photovoltaic industry. We're beginning to see this now. Norway has made the commitment to eliminating internal combustion engines uh, in automobiles. So all around the world, we're seeing big, big changes in the energy uh, sector, the energy profile, but it's supported by key policies and regulations that send a clear signal to the marketplace to say, yes, the future is not going to be in fossil fuels. The future is going to be in renewable energy, efficiency, clean, green energy. And those signals, I think, are crucially important because it tells the private sector, if you invest in this, you, you can count that these, the government's going to be behind you. We're going to have your back, right? There's going to be a demand for it because the policies are going to support demand, and we're not going back. And I think one of the problems we've had in the United States is that we start on a certain track, and then it gets reversed. Congress repeals it, or they want to repeal it. And so the private sector in the United States and citizens, we get very, very mixed signals. And so we're not sure if an investment in renewables is going to be a good idea. But all around the world, everywhere else, you're seeing solar, wind, efficiency really exploding. And Bloomberg News had a great piece about a year ago. Again, a little known fact, but in 60 countries around the world now, including many developing nations, solar power is now the cheapest form of new installed electric power. So, but you raise an interesting question, which is there's this, um, California is big, but, it, but you're describing a somewhat decentralized response to, to climate change here. If California's doing this and, and New York is doing that, and 
I mean, they can take a leadership role, but I wonder if at some level, you know, isn't national American democracy somehow incompatible with solving a problem of this scale? No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> uh, but I just spoke, so I'll let Alex speak. <laughs> well, just to clarify the question, national American democracy well, incompatible. Uh, congressional, with you know, if, if we, we can do these patchwork solutions. So Massachusetts can do this and New York can do that. But can we come together as a nation and what does it take? What kind of activism, activism will it take? Well, what level of commitment on, as individuals will it take to, to move us off the dime as a nation? Well, I mean... <laughs> Just to be blunt, um, I think that if there was a certain other person in the, in you know, holding the executive branch, we wouldn't be having, we, we wouldn't be having uh, this conversation. And as the New York Times article, you know, has shown today, the past administration was going down another, you know, another avenue, and though we were still not as advanced as even countries like China and India. I mean, China has, a, has just, I mean, outperformed us in. Um, in renewables because they have to perform. Uh, they have to perform because, um, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, um, as it is today, uh, needs uh, to stay in, if, if they want to survive, uh, they need to show their population that uh, uh, the effects uh, of climate change they can deal with because um, if those, if it keeps on going in a certain direction, um, they may not be around. Um, and, uh, but I think that you know, in regards to a national, in a national conversation, I think that what this election, you know, was, a, was definitely a wake-up call, and it shows you the power of the, of the presidency and that what we should be thinking about when we vote, and when we vote for a president. Um, and, um, you know, we talk about Congress, and we, and, we, and, we talk about, and we talk about the Senate, but, I mean, there are some Republican ideas, um, you know, including the carbon tax, uh, which, you know, people um, like somebody I know named Jerry Taylor, who runs the Narskanen Institute, who used to be at Cato, has pushed and left Cato actually because of these issues of climate change, um, and, has, and has support. So I think that, that there, there, there are issues, they are there. The problem is, is that there is a, a president that is engaging in, uh, in, um, in policies that are out of whack, uh, with the majority of the American people, as, as uh, I think you, you elegantly put. I, I, I really just uh, would love to just jump on, I, I guess, the, the original question that you had, which was, is, is national uh, policy somehow antithetical to kind of liberty or, um, uh, or whatnot? I mean, I, I think um, that actually strikes at the heart of uh, of why we as a nation more than 50 years ago came together and said we want a Clean Air Act, we want a Clean Water Act, we want an Endangered Species Act, we want a Safe Drinking Water Act. Millions of people stood up in 1970, 1969 and demanded those things because the rivers were on fire. I mean, literally, like in New York, you could not see across the East River to Brooklyn. Like, it just was too smoggy. Um, when, if you were in LA, you had to check the newspaper report, report to determine whether or not your kids could go out and play soccer that afternoon. I mean, this wasn't that long ago. I think many of us remember those days. And again, what happened in those days was people stood up and demanded that the national government do something about that. And you know who, who answered that question? Rich, Richard Nixon, of all people. I mean, most of the big Republican laws that we currently still have and we're protecting um, as hard as we can right now were passed through Republican administrations. So th this history or this kind of reality that, this, that somehow environmentalism is a liberal thing or a democratic thing is just not true and, and clearly not evident um, in our own history. But the reality of why we actually think it's important for national, for federal governments to do these things, I mean, I actually think it goes, goes all the way back to just the basic concept of civilization and the role of, of civilized communities in thinking about the commons, right? I mean, it is the basis of the Clean Air Act, the, the, the Clean Water Act, that there are things that we all uh, are reliant upon, and if we, we only manage them in a piecemeal sort of way, are we actually managing to our best interests, to our highest interests? I mean, climate change is probably the, the biggest uh, uh, example or em the biggest, most emblematic of that concept and, and while hard to perhaps maybe understand, I mean, it is about our self-interest. It is about our ability to not only have, um, again, clean air to breathe, 
water to drink, but a, a future for our family and for our kids. I mean, what, what, what is, I, I guess, how, how is that not completely connected to our liberties and our freedoms as Americans? But if I could add to that, because this is a very important point on a lot of different levels. So Rhea is absolutely right. The federal government has played a hugely important role, particularly for things like clean air and clean water that cross state and local boundaries. But at the same time, if you ask yourself, well, why did Richard Nixon sign all these great pieces of legislation? It's not that he was a great environmentalist, so don't get that idea, because some people might like to reconstruct him that. I mean, that's false. I mean, I've spent time in the Nixon archives. Nixon was acutely aware that the American people wanted this. He was responding to the pressure of public opinion, and that's where we all come in, because we, expressing our voices, expressing our opinions, a lot of leaders don't lead, they follow. I mean, one of the most important things Bob Inglis ever said to me, and Bob Inglis is a Republican who lost his seat in South Carolina when he started talking about climate change. He said, you have to understand that most congressmen are petrified of their constituents, right? And the fact is, they don't hear from us very often. And there are certain issues, though, that they do hear a lot about and that people mobilize. So we need to, we need to make sure that our congressmen, our senators, our local representatives, and our president hear from us because they do respond to what they think voters are going to do at the next election. And this was crucially important for Richard Nixon, and we have lots and lots of evidence to show that. The other thing that was crucially important, and this gets back to what I want to argue is a both and, not an either or way of looking at this problem. It is true that the federal government, all of this landmark legislation was crucially important, has been crucially important, and we need to make sure to fight to protect it going forward. But if you ask the question, you know, what was putting the pressure on the federal government to act, a lot of the answer to that, it's not the whole thing, but one important piece was California. And why was California so important? Well, you already referred to it, but it was worse than you said. People were dropping dead in the street from air pollution. There was what scientists call acute mortality, not just coughing, not just not being able to see the San Bernardino Mountains, but people dropping dead. And this happened in London as well. And so California began to move towards legislation, and the automobile industry was panic-stricken because they knew that whatever California did would affect the automobiles that they had to sell. And so there became pressure from the private sector for the federal government to act so that we wouldn't have a patchwork quilt of 50 different sets of cleaner regulation, but we'd have a uniform level playing field that would actually be better for the private sector. So that's an important part of this message as well, that uniform federal, le uniform federal legislation is actually in general better for the economy than the patchwork quilt, but it doesn't mean that what happens on the state level doesn't matter. When states begin to move, it puts pressure on the federal government to act. Well, we're hitting on something really interesting here, but I think is, is crucial and we're talking about impacts, when you're talking about a river on fire, or people dropping dead in the street, that's not happening in the United States yet from climate change. And Actually, it is, but we don't know, and that's part of the problem. Do you want to talk about that? Well, no, I'm saying it is, and it's happening. I mean, I think that's, I mean... Well, let's talk about impacts for a moment, because, you know, here in East Hampton, I, I look around for an example, and I say, well, we've got some, um, you know, ocean acidification and clamshells are a little thinner, and somebody's going to lose their oceanfront mansion because climate change is accelerating the, the, uh, the erosion through, through sea level rise. At least here, in the security of where we are, the climate change impacts seem abstract. They seem at a great distance, and consequently, I think, action seems like something we can put off. But maybe you can talk about contemporary impacts here in the States or abroad where you all have traveled and work us through some of those, why it matters now. Uh, well, I can start, but I know, Rhea, did you want to take that? Or? Well, I mean, uh, how many years ago was Hurricane Sandy? Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think that I this... I've forgotten that. Right, I, don't, I, I think that we forget. And, and granted, we forget very um, there, there, there was a lot of confusion as, as to whether or not you could attribute these big kind of super storms or really weird um, uh, weather patterns to climate change. And actually, increasingly so, you are able to attribute some of these big, big weather events to, to the fact that the, the world is warming. So I, I, I 
think that um, I think that the reality that we have again, I mean, Weather Channel is just like killing it these days, right? That there's just random and really weird weather things that are happening almost all the time throughout the country. But beyond those weather things, I mean, we're on the verge of having climate refugees in this country. I mean, entire villages in Alaska are one storm away from being wiped out into the sea. Literally, they've been there from time immemorial, and one storm away from being wiped out in the sea. I mean, this this is, the, the impacts here are happening. So whether it's climate refugees in Alaska or the reality of how many tens of millions of dollars that Miami is spending in actually completely <laughs> elevating the entire infrastructure of their city because the fact that when there's a full moon and high tide, it floods. So, I, I mean, we're experiencing these impacts and, and yes, there is a disconnect between those impacts and the reality of the policy tools that we have to try to combat them. But I think most people kind of feel it. Most people get it. Most people are seeing it. I mean, I think you only have to speak to somebody who owns beachfront property here to understand the, you know, the, the issues of, of erosion. So I think that it's, it's even a high class problem as, as opposed to being a, a lower one. But I mean, take even the issue, uh, the issue of migration. So now uh, you have, um, you know, this huge migration crisis. We're calling it a crisis even though, I mean, you know, from a pure numbers wise, there's more people uh, in, and I'm dealing here with Europe, you know, there are more people actually uh, moving or displaced within Africa than going from Africa to um, to Europe, but the, you know, the, um, the Europeans and us seem to really care about that, so I'll focus on, on what they care about, um, which is the, this quote unquote migration crisis that's, um, you know, um, partly due to, uh, partly due to uh, what happened in Syria and what didn't happen in Syria, what happened in Libya and what didn't happen in Libya, but also climate change. Um, so one of the biggest uh, ethnic groups now making the sea crossing from uh, on the Mediterranean are Bangladeshis. Uh, it's perplexing to people because these people aren't technically refugees. Um, but if you're a Bangladeshi and you have a small rice farm and it's gonna be underwater in 20, 30, 40, years, you know, is making the investment of, of giving a smuggler $5,000 and, uh, and uh, selling your rice farm uh, to go into the Tripoli airport and then be smuggled uh, to take the parrot, you know, to, uh, to the, uh, you know, to the shores of, of, of Libya to make the perilous journey to Italy a, a, a stupid investment? I don't know. I don't know. And these, you know, they, they may just be smarter than the rest of us in realizing that you know they need to get somewhere to get to get an economic future, but that is somewhere, and that is breeding then, of course, into issues of radicalization and then and nationalism in Europe and all these things that that you know that that we're so frightened about. But it just shows you that the very issue of climate change and has impacted something like the like the refugee refugee crisis or what we call the refugee crisis. So you see it as a, as, as a global destabilization. At, that's happening today. That's happening now. It's, hap it's happening now, and these people are taking, pre you know, preemptive, preemptive measures. But if I could add to this, I, I think that's right. But I think one of the problems with this issue is that, unlike civil rights, or gay rights, or the women's suffrage movement, which you talked about, and which were sort of grassroots movement, mostly driven by the people who were suffering the indignities of discrimination or being denied the right to vote, climate change is a very different kind of social movement because it was discovered by scientists. That's the fact. And I live my life with scientists, and I can tell you they're terrible communicators. And they don't like to personalize things because they think personalization is the opposite of science. They think science is objective and depersonal. So if I get up and tell a story about a person who's you know, aunt died in a heat wave, or whose husband died in a heat wave, or whose children were swept away in a flood and drowned, because people die in heat waves and people die in floods, and we know that both heat waves and floods in the United States, not just in Syria, although there too, of course, but right here in the United States, mortality from heat waves is increasing as a result of climate change. And we know that, and scientists know that, but they don't get up and say it. And not only do they not say it, they do even worse than that. So I'll tell you a story, and I'll make it personal, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? So I was at a, a meeting some weeks ago, with, or a couple months ago, with some very famous climate scientists and some 
fairly powerful and influential people um, who worked for attorney generals. And this was about the issue of responsibility, legal responsibility for climate change. And it happened that the group of scientists were mostly people who had just written this very, very major report relating to the attribution of extreme weather events. And this is really important scientific work, but it was specifically about the physical evidence about floods, hurricanes, superstorms. And there's a reason we called Sandy a superstorm, right? It was worse than it would have been were it weren't for climate change, and we do know that. But one of the people in the audience said, well, I'm from Michigan, and my attorney general is not too worried about sea level rise. You know? And he said, can you talk to me about the health effects? Are there any health effects from climate change? And this scientist said, no. <laughs> and I almost had a heart attack. And, and I know, but I knew he was responding to the first question, can you tell me about it? And what he meant was, that's not my expertise. So at the coffee break, I went up to this fellow and said, call George Luber at CDC, who works on the health impacts of climate change, and he will tell you what you need to know. And he did, and he did. So there are huge climate effects. People are getting sick. People are dying in the United States today. Floods, sea level rise. These are all happening now. But the scientific community has not done a good job of talking about it. And it's because they're scientists. And that's why we have to talk about it. And we also have to work with our scientific colleagues to help them figure out how to talk about it more effectively. And that's one of the things I've been working on a lot. I'm sure you, know, you have as well. Um, they know a lot of important things that they haven't clearly communicated to us. So, so is something you, you want to add? I guess I want to go back to this, um, this question that you posed earlier around activism and kind of the role of activism, um, because I, 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 I guess I worry that we're still in this conversation around trying to convince people um, uh, or trying to get people active. And the reality is I think we're in this incredible moment, and it's a moment that I, I've never personally experienced in my lifetime. I mean, I was born in 1970 and kind of missed a lot of the civil rights movement, but I'm the beneficiary of, again, uh, you know, f almost 50 years of progressive policies around um, both, both uh, social policies as well as environmental policies. You know, what what's happening now, I mean, Bill McKibben has this great... Uh, quote where he basically says, well, weekends are for fighting fascism now. Um, and I think a lot of people, uh, you know, are kind of experiencing this rhythm. I mean, certainly I, for a while, was like, okay, well, where's the next protest? Um, you know, I'd never done that before. And what was so interesting about going to these protests is that I was surrounded by literally, in some cases, tens of thousands of people that had never done anything like that before. I mean, they'd never even picked up their phone and called their congressman, right? But but they were they got on the plane or the bus or the train or they got themselves to Washington, D.C. or wherever it was because they felt like they needed to stand up and speak out. Um, and so... You, what, you, I, I refer to the first Earth Day as kind of, you know, ushering in this era. Um, you know, the Women's March uh, that happened in January of this year, one out of every hundred Americans showed up somewhere that day to protest. That That's actually, again, pretty unprecedented in the last couple of decades. And as an advocacy organization, we have not only seen kind of an outpouring of people, um, of our members, of new members kind of coming to us, but the thing that's really interesting is people want, don't just want to, you know, give us $15 or read our newsletter. People want to know what they can do. They want to know what they can do. And it's not, again, just about calling a congressman or signing a petition. It's what they can do in their own communities. It's what they can do in their own states. Um, it is something that I think is palpable, is exciting, is an opportunity for a, a, mo a movement moment kind of thing. I mean, I, I do think that we're experiencing it, we're seeing it right now, this movement and how we shape that and how we encourage that moving forward is, is, is the jobs, I think, of many of us. Um, uh, and to that end, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, NRDC is really trying to figure out how do we make those connections um, to, to individuals that want to do more. Um, you know, we've started a new website, nrdc.org, all in. Um, and on that website, we're going to give you lots of different ideas depending on how much time you have. You have a minute, you have five minutes, you have ten minutes, you have more time than that. Here's the suite of options that you can do, um, actions that you can take um, that can get you engaged and involved, again, that I think is responsive to the level of energy that we're seeing right now.
Alex, you've spent a lot of time working with activists around, around the world. I mean, do, do you see a level of interest in this subject? Or, and and how, how does it work? How does philanthropy uh, fit in with, with motivating individuals in, uh, to put pressure on government or put pressure on the private sector? Well, I don't want to overstate uh, the impact of uh, philanthropy because philanthropy is, is, is not government. Um, and it's you know given to to a lot of people by the blessings of the IRS and our tax exempt codes. So I don't want to glorify it uh, when I don't have to. But um, but on but on, but on this on this issue, I think it is important because it's a question about about narrative um, and who's conveying the message and who are the people um, that that we're getting behind. There are, there are a lot of sort of intricacies in this. I mean, I'm reminded of you know sort of you know, visiting, um, you know, just, I mean, just being in shock of seeing, uh, you know, being in, in the Peruvian Amazon and just seeing swaths of just uncut uh, land. And which, you know, after having traveled in places in Southeast Asia, you would just not see. And I mean, you know, you, you would not, you could not see from, you know, from, from, basically one horizon to the next, something without a palm oil plantation, et cetera. And then you go, and so this is a, you know, this is, but this is a, this is an, a, a real issue of conservation because it's better not to cut these trees down in the first place. Most of the solutions around climate change are what you, are what people and are scientists in the, and, and uh, you know, um, policy wonks in the area call at scale solutions. So you go to the other side, of the Amazon, and you meet with and you meet with Brazilians, and they're basically analyzing down to the amount of grass that, or you know, that needs to grow for the emission of a fart of a cow, um, you know, that com that that comes out um, because in Brazil you're in an at scale um, solution. So I think that you know, one of the things that that we need to to also understand is that you know it's better to not cut down the trees in the first place and to not get to these at scale solutions. But there are, there are people in the, in the environmental movement, there are scientists that believe that actually we need to get to a global at scale solution to find, uh, to find uh, you know, um, or a global at scale problem to find a solution with policy without looking at these nuances. So I think there's a, a real place for conservation at a, at a local level where you're yet to be at an ad, you know, to have these ad scale problems while at the same time at areas that have already gone to being at scale, whether it's in Brazil or in Indonesia, having the, having the avenue for that. But these sides don't play well together. And, and, and local activism matters, having the conversations as the climate groups here. That, in your opinion, it matters to have local people talking about climate change, talking about these issues. Absolutely. I mean, I was thinking, we were talking earlier about Norway, and of course every time Norway does something great, it's in the New York Times, and we all think, what a perfect, great, terrific country. But something like 47 of America's states are bigger than Norway in terms of population and emissions and economic activity, so why don't we get equally excited about that? And if you think about, there are cities in America that are bigger than Norway <laughs> in terms of population. So if all those cities and all those states started doing things, that would be really significant, and we could have very significant emissions reductions, and then it also creates momentum, because you know, we've been talking about social movements, but all social movements start somewhere, or somewheres, sometimes there's more than one initiating place, but they start and they grow and they spread, and so part of what needs to happen now, and I think this gets back to you know, your point, we have a lot of, um, well, let's call it points of light, to use a favorite George H.W. Bush expression, um, and remember, it was George H.W. Bush who first introduced emissions trading in the Clean Air Act Amendment, so that's another good Republican you know, market-based solution that we have an example of, and we know it can be done, and we can know it worked, right? So we have many, many points of light across this country where real change is happening, but we need to start connecting those points and make it grow and make it bigger. And that's where I see the power of the individual and the power of the community, that we can all participate and become part of what becomes... I'm going to mix my metaphors now, but part of what becomes a big fabric, right, or a big patchwork quilt, that the pieces start small and they may look insignificant to begin with, but as they connect, they become significant. So there's a, a bit of a controversy here about deep water wind, as I'd mentioned. Um, 
So does something like deep water wind, the megawatts it will generate to power 50,000 homes on Long Island, how does that matter? How does that play? Uh, does it put Long Island in a leadership role? Are we doing something good here by looking to wind power? Uh, well, I think projects like Deepwater Wind are directly correlated to uh, the state policies that, that currently uh, Governor Cuomo is, is uh, promoting. I mean, a renewable portfolio standards actually create these market opportunities for renewable generation to happen, and the best renewable generation is generation that happens as locally to the need as possible. So I, I do think that there's uh, there's considerable opportunity associated with, uh, with renewable energy generation, and as Naomi referenced earlier, I mean, uh, solar uh, uh, costs per kilowatt have decreased something like 73% in the last six years, wind 66%, right? Th so these, these, these new forms of energy generation are oftentimes cheaper than even natural gas and certainly, um, uh, certainly other forms of more traditional uh, energy combustion. So there's economic benefit, um, there's obviously environmental benefit. I, I think the reality is um, when you start citing any infrastructure, whether it's clean energy infrastructure or dirty uh, energy infrastructure, there's going to be some degree of controversy. But I guess I'd encourage people to kind of think about it from a slightly larger um, uh, perspective. Um, you know, I, I can't help but uh, but uh, get triggered, I guess, if you will, um, when you when you say deep water um, wind. Um, I think Deepwater Horizon, which was the largest uh, environmental disaster that has ever happened, actually, in the United States. Um, I, uh, I was actually at the Department of the Interior, the agency responsible for that at the time of the spill. And literally, I mean, I think everybody saw it on TV. Like, you could see the oil coming out of the hole um, on the, the Gulf of the, um, uh, uh, on, on the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that was a da disaster of cataclysmic proportions. Um, and uh, the reality that this administration uh, wants to actually open up offshore development to, to actually expand that type of deep water drilling um, will have direct impact on coastal communities like the one that we're sitting in right now. So there's the, the reality that there, there have been and, um, and c will continue to be real risks and threats associated to our livelihoods and to our communities with the more traditional forms of dirty energy. Um, you know, if, if, if and, and, and I'm not saying that there's not some environmental consequence to wind infrastructure, but in proportion to, uh, again, uh, uh, the alternative, um, I would say they're, they're, they're much more minor. Um, and certainly wind technology has improved dramatically in the last couple of years. And I think that one of the big things that's been controversy about them is, is the bird kill, the associated killing of um, migratory birds. Um, and that really, again, because of technology, has also decreased uh, really significantly in the last couple of years. And so, again, it's just this proportionality of how you look at opportunity or consequence. And if I could just jump in, I mean, you're absolutely right. So no, you know, there's no free lunch, no technology is perfect. So you have to weigh the relative costs and benefits of different things. But, but when the people of Nantucket killed Cape Wind, that was a huge rhetorical win for the right wing, for the fossil fuel industry. And I, I can tell you, I have been to Wyoming, I have been to Idaho, I have spoken in 48 of the 50 states of this country, and I have to get up in public and, and explain to people why the good liberals of Massachusetts turned down Cape Wind. And it is a, that was a giant rhetorical loss for the environmental movement and a giant win for the anti-renewable side. So I think, you know, you have to think really hard through these issues, but every renewable installation that you have, whether it's wind or solar or, or efficiency, every gigawatt counts, every megawatt counts, every kilowatt counts, but the momentum and the symbolic value matters a lot too. I remember a few years ago, a colleague of mine who was just kind of a grouchy, you know what, says to me, he goes, driving an electric car is just symbolic. And I said, well, it is partly symbolic, and symbols matter. Otherwise, a billion people around this globe wouldn't be wearing crosses around their necks. Yeah. So, so what are some of the other things that individuals should be thinking about, individuals can be doing? Um, what are some of the bright lights that, that you refer to at an individual level? 
I think everybody gets a bright light every November, and they get to send a message to Washington, they get to send a message to their local congressman, and there's 2017, there's 2018, there's a census coming in 2020, and um, you know, when I look at the macro picture, I just say, you know, I hope all this activism winds up in us actually impacting change, which happens through, you know, the, the political process. And um, let's take that gift we get every November and use it wisely. So what happened, you know, it, with a, an administration that's really peopled by climate deniers, Scott Pruitt, the head of the EPA, you know, famously doesn't believe, as, I believe in carbon as a driver of, of climate change. Um, does the... Uh, climate change movement go into sort of a defensive crouch now? Or, you know, what is the right posture if you believe strongly in this now? Well, first of all, I have to just interrupt. We don't use the language of belief, right? <laughs> climate change is not a belief. Mm -hmm. This is a scientifically established fact. That would be like me talking about believing in gravity or believing in DNA or believing in plate tectonics or quantum mechanics, okay? So it's not about belief. So, but now the question is, what do we do? So I think you're absolutely right. Obviously, voting is crucial, but I'm guessing that this is an audience of people who probably all do vote. But I also walked and cycled around this community today, and honestly, I'm kind of surprised not to see more solar panels. I'm guessing a lot of people in this community have the means to install solar panels. I mean, one of the challenges about renewable energy and also efficiency you almost always save money in the long run, but there are upfront installation costs even if you just put in new windows. So for working class families in this country, that's a real problem. And so we need to think about financing, microfinancing, green financing to help working class families, middle class families make those upfront investments. But in a well-off community, I think there's no excuse for not having solar panels on your roof. In Carlisle, Massachusetts, we get pretty much 100% of our electricity now in my house from solar which means if we can do it in Massachusetts, you can do it in New York. One of my good friends does it in Madison, Wisconsin. You don't have to live in Arizona to get most of your solar power from, most of your electricity from solar power. Um, and it's something you can do tomorrow, right? So every, in fact, if you're a homeowner, I get asked a lot, like, well, what can I do? What's the most important thing I can do? And of course, it depends a little bit on where you live and who you are. But if you're a homeowner, one of the most important things you could do tomorrow, if you haven't done it already, is to put solar panels on your roof. Now, another thing we haven't talked about yet is food, but food is a really big one, and there's a lot of very, very strong evidence now about the environmental impacts of different forms of food production. Some people don't want to hear that eating steak is really bad, and if I were in Wyoming, I wouldn't say this. No, I would, but I'd be prepared for pushback. But here's the thing. You don't have to become a vegetarian but you can make a very big difference by reducing your beef consumption. And it turns out that beef is way worse than poultry and eggs. So you don't have to be a vegan, but that's something you can do and you could start tonight. So there are a lot of things that we have in our power in terms of the way we live our lives. But in addition, there are these other things where we can connect to other people and become part of a larger movement. So that's how I view it. It's a kind of both end. And the great things about the things you can do yourself is it's really empowering. Like, I feel good every night when I drive home into my garage and see the solar panels on the roof, but I also feel good when I get together with other terrific, great people who are doing wonderful things and feel like I'm not alone in this fight. If I can just pick up on the, the I mean, I, I think both of uh, your points on you know, political action as well as individual action are just absolutely right. On, on the food um, issue in particular, I mean, I think <clears throat> the reality is the food industry in this country has changed radically in the last 20 years, and that change was primarily driven through individual consumer choice. Right? I mean, the whole uh, organic movement was built on individuals making different kinds of choices at their supermarket for what it is they stuck in their refrigerators. I mean, make no mistake about it. It is individual action that collectively results in large-scale change. It's the only thing that ever has. So while we are in this time of great great distress, um, don't ever forget that you can make a difference, right? It really is the basis.
basis of how we've always de developed progress in this country. And so how should we come together again as a nation, as a community, as concerned citizens around the things that we care about? I mean, that's what gets me up in the morning. And granted, like I have a lot of stuff that's kind of hard to deal with during the course of the day, but that is really, I think, the, the, the reason why I continue to have optimism even during these times. Just one, one more uh, tool, but I'm probably speaking now too much from um, from an you know from a NGO or advocacy lens, but which is litigation. Uh, you know, I think is a is a true class action suits. Um, you know, testing various forms of, of, of litigation. You had the you know you had the issue with Exxon, um, and I think that it, you know we have seen that basically the you know what's what's you know even though I. I do still, you know, don't want to take take for granted that you know our democracy will be around tomorrow because I think that there are enemies of it um, in the White House. Uh, that um, you know the courts and have played an instrumental role in safeguarding so much of our democracy and 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 that litigation, especially against um, key actors that are not that are breaking the law, um, is a very key tool and uh, something that we should all get behind. I'm so glad you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, we are up to 30 lawsuits yeah. against the Trump administration. We were almost averaging one out of at one every every three days. So, um, and it is working. Um, you know, courts are are in many cases our last line of defense. Um, and judges, unlike some politicians, actually consider fact, not alternative fact. Um, Some politicians and, do too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, again, I think that is an incredibly important tool that many organizations are using these days and certainly around environmental issues. Again, it, it is our last line of defense. Yeah, if I can underscore that. So some of my earlier work was on the history of the tobacco industry. And I used to get asked a lot, well, given how incredibly powerful the tobacco industry was and how it owned senators and congressmen, how did we ever get action on tobacco? And I thought about that a lot. And I think it's like a lot of these things. It's not a simple answer, but it seems to me there were three things that were crucial. The first was the science. The science that proved that tobacco killed people was crucial, so it's really important for us to know that in climate change, the science is crucial too. And we do need to understand the science, be educated about it, be able to explain it clearly to our friends and family and neighbors. But the science alone was not enough. And then the second thing that was really important was grassroots activism. The fact that many communities began to pass anti-smoking ordinances created a groundswell of support to say, this really isn't acceptable. It's not acceptable, you know, for you to smoke and, and I die, right? And the third key thing was legal action. And I always say, I know people love to bash lawyers. I love lawyers. I think lawyers are great. I'm incredibly proud that my daughter's going to be one. And you have Michael Klarman coming soon, fantastic uh, scholar of the Constitution and Civil Rights. So when he's here, that would be a great thing to get him to talk about. So I wonder, um, this might be a good time to open up if there are any questions from the audience about any of these subjects. Um, and I think we've got some team members with microphones who can come down. There's some down right here in the front. Do the long reach. Go ahead. Um, as an elder who's old enough to have marched in the first Earth Day in 1970, it's really sweet. <laughs> to hear that the new head of NRDC was born the year that, <laughs> that my friend John Adams and some other young lawyers founded NRDC. <laughs> um, we've you've been a few questions from David about the connection between local and national. So very big and dangerous things are happening the environmental issues and legislation and enforcement in this country today. But in a way, all politics is local. And here on, in the first district, we have elected official, Lee Zeldin, who has voted against the environment in nine out of 10 environmental issues that have come up. This is in next year, he will be up for election again and there is something very important we can do politically here. 
uh, in terms of getting a local representative like Tim Bishop was, who will again care about the environment that is so important to us. But the, maybe the question for the panel on that is, here's a guy who won pretty handily the last time out and whose climate denying package finds a pretty resonant audience right here on Eastern Long Island. And so how do you, how do you reach his, his voters? How do you turn out his voters? And, and how, just in case, I mean, this is a very local issue, East Hampton votes very well on the environment and is actually very good on organic food because of the leadership of the Peconic Land Trust out here and our wonderful farmers markets. Um, the, those votes for an anti-environmental <coughs> member of Congress come from Brookhaven and from the But it's an excellent question on, on the, on the, on the issue of What can we do grass? most effectively here to change that? As a, on the question of grassroots activism, it's a really good example. So what do people say here who are interested in this district and perhaps turning this district back toward a pro-environment uh, representative in Congress? How, where do they go? How, what do they do? Well, I think it's making it really clear that he will be held to account for the votes that he's taking and that those votes are out of sync with the community that he's supposed to be, supposedly representing. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, we've seen a lot of the kind of town hall protests in the last several months of people kind of showing up at these these coffee clatches that, you know, I think a lot of people never showed up to them before. They were easy. Not anymore. I mean, people are going there and they're, they're giving people a piece of their mind. And as a consequence, a lot of the congressmen don't want to do it anymore. I mean, whether they show up to coffee clatches, they're going to answer their phones. Um, uh, and, and they have staffers that, that take messages. I mean, make your voice heard because that actually really, really does matter. I've been on the Hill on a numerous uh, occasions over the last couple of months where literally like the switchboard in the Capitol has just gone down. Um, that registers in incredibly powerful ways. So, I mean, I guess first making that register and then actually having a consequence if the, um, if positions don't change or if he doesn't ameliorate his views on the issues that you care about. Just, just, just to apropos to that and, and the calling, um, you, could, you could make a very strong argument, and I've had this discussion with people on the Hill, you could make a very strong argument that it was the amount of calls that came in against these, this proposed health legislation that made the difference. Uh, a lot of it was thanks to Planned Parenthood 86, because, and, and engaging, because 86% of the phone calls actually came from women. But you can make a very persuading argument, and um, I'm, I'm actually a believer in this, that it was the amount of phone calls that got a lot of those people, and it was also the town hall meetings that got a congressman like, like Moran in Kansas, who was, you know, to the right of Attila the Hun, but, you know, um, uh, but, you know but, but still, uh, you know, came to reason on, 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 on the health care issue and didn't let uh, countless Americans die. I think the other thing about this also, you know, Bob Inglis was a six-term congressman, and then he got targeted by the Tea Party, and he went down to a huge defeat, and the congressman who replaced him was Trey Gowdy. So this was more than small local significance, right? But, you know, two can play that game, right? And if people begin to organize, if people field a credible alternative candidate, if people get out and canvas, it's not just about voting on November is it seventh this year? I don't know. But I mean, it's not just about voting in November. It's about all the work that goes in up front to field credible candidates. And so I think, you know, we need to do more of that. Um, when I was a child growing up, my parents were a member of a local political club, and it was a big part of their life. And I was thinking about this after the last election. Nobody I know is a member of a political club. Like that whole way of organizing seems to have died, but maybe it's time to start thinking about bringing that back. We have. Um, we have a question. Of, well, I have a comment and a question. Um, I, too, got involved in the environmental movement back in the 1970s, and I got into it in a different, from a different angle, and that was from the work environment movement. I worked for a great American named Tony Mazzocchi, who created a coalition between labor and the environmental movement, which resulted in the passage of both the EPA Act and the OSHA Act. And it was a coalition that was, I think, very much responsible because it brought together people who now seem so separated and disengaged from the environmental movement with environmentalists. So what I would like to ask um, the panel actually on this is, 
What work is being done? I mean, at a time when Trump voters in West Virginia are saying, we need coal to come back, what is the environmental movement, what is the climate change movement doing to reach out to workers, especially in a time where we don't have the same kind of union strength that we used to have? So, um this is a question that, that I uh, have spent a lot of time really trying to um, uh, think through solutions on because I agree with you 100%. I think there's now uh, a bigger disconnect between labor and environment than we've had in decades. Um, I think that, that's act that, that disconnect, is, disconnect is actually being exacerbated and purposefully so by this administration and the policies of this administration. Um, but I think uh, I think the environmental community is really culpable in not seizing the narrative around the true economic opportunity of our issues. I think I, I think we we've kind of gone off on separate branches again over the course of many years, um, and there is this perception that somehow being an environmentalist is going to be bad for my bottom line, right? My um, and so how we change that by actually working on uh, uh, legislation that is both good for the environment and for good uh, good for middle class workers is something that I think we've been trying to do with this clean energy legislation that I've mentioned. In all of those states, it was coalitions of environment and labor and business that had to come together to get them through. Um, so it's still possible to happen, but it really needs to more centrally focus on this narrative of what are good paying jobs and how do we stand up for them as environmentalists because those are environmental issues as well. And that's, it's a little bit of a tricky thing sometimes because again, the branches of the tree I think have kind of grown off in different directions, but it's a very important thing I think for us to come back to. I think we have time for one more question. Is there, yeah. I, I think I'd like to focus back to the very beginning thing that you talked about is understanding the issue and, and getting it to be personal to me. Um, because the environment's gonna fall apart in 50 years. I'm not gonna be alive in 50 years. And yes, I care about my grandkids and my grandkids is, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I still don't think even after listening tonight, and I'm, I'm very much an, a supporter of this, this movement and the facts that back it up, um, how do we get more people to understand you, as you talked about, not understanding the issues or originally. Um, how did Norway get everybody behind them? What language did they use? Had, I know China, they were afraid of getting killed, but Norway, they weren't afraid of getting killed. So how do we get that? What's the story? Because Brookhaven, yes, it's, uh, people in East Hampton are going to believe that, but in Brookhaven, they're not going to believe it and they don't think it's real. And it, the, the, the facts may be real, but they don't believe it's gonna affect them. We have to get that out, and I don't know how to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's a core question. So, for, for, so in the case of, Norway's a, Norway's a, bit, uh, a bit of an anomaly uh, in all this because it's the issue of a sort of what, the one country that ran a sovereign wealth fund and wound up not um, in, you know, in corruption and nepotism, et cetera, partly because it was Norway and a Scandinavian country. But um, what Norway did was it, was it incentivized um, it took a global perspective and said, you know, look, we're going to incentivize Indonesia, Peru, et cetera, to cut down, um, you know, carbon emissions, um, you know, cut down the amount of um, the trees that they, you know, that they are, are defore, you know, are, are cu or cut down on the issue of deforestation <laughs> because it benefits the world entirely. It's a public good. So they gave an economic incentive to pay, to basically uh, pay the, the governments not to cut down the forest for the benefit of us all, because it's all, it's all of our world. Um, and that's, that's been pretty much, pretty much the Norway model. It's been successful, but unfortunately, um, the economic incentives of going the other way are oftentimes uh, worse. So Norway has had to pull back on some of the funding to Peru and Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera, because of this issue. And actually, in the case of Indonesia, it's only becoming an issue on, the, on a very local level because finally people are finding out that, um, that in local villages, the sort of palm oil industry is just you know, decimating large swaths of land, displacing people, et cetera. But in Norway, it came down to incentives. 
But if I can just say something, a short answer to that. So you're absolutely right, and this is the real challenge for us to each try to figure out what we can do to make people understand that this isn't about the future, it's about now. So I wrote a book that attempted to do exactly that. It's a little dystopic novel. It's called The Collapse of Western Civilization. So shameless plug. <laughs> I hope you will read it, but the interesting thing, this book has been translated into 11 languages. It's selling much better overseas than here in the United States. So I don't know, maybe you can persuade Alec to make a movie out of it or something. <laughs> Let's bring Alec out here for the final word. <laughs> and that was not planned. <laughs> Okay, so before we stop, uh, I want to uh, uh, ask one question myself, um, and then we're going to thank everybody and, uh, and head out. But uh, we were talking backstage, and I was saying, so let's assume that uh, we have uh, a change in Washington in 2020 and in uh, January of 2021. And of course, in anticipation of that, in advance of that, there'll be a lot of discussions about what the priorities should be and what should be done in, uh, in terms of policy. But name two or three things. Each of our panelists name two things that you think we should be, and we talked about this backstage, an immediate course of action by then that we should do. So number one, immediately stop subsidizing all fossil fuels. Most people have no idea that fossil fuels are incredibly heavily subsidized. How much is oil subsidized? Well, in the billions, for every, right? yeah, tri no, trillions, trillions. For every dollar we subsidize renewable, $10 subsidizes fossil fuels. So that, number one. Are you one. talking about uh, war making as well? And, uh, no, no, not, not just direct that. subsidies, not <laughs> including the <laughs> okay. Persian not Gulf, including, and the exactly. not even including, including that. Not including no. war for oil. Not including okay. war for oil, just the direct subsidies. So that's number one. And then number two, stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure because every pipeline we build, every export terminal is committing us to 30, 50, 75 years of continued fossil fuel use. And what so, does that do to our energy? Because people are always saying, what does that do to our energy uh, capabilities, meaning they, they, they say you can't just turn off the well, right. grid and you, you're, exactly. you're going to have to have gas. In. Exactly. It locks us in. So you have to start the transition. So if you're going to stop using fossil fuels, you have to start to stop, right? The stopping has to begin now, and that means no more new development. Damn it, you're right, Naomi. Okay. Well, <laughs> they pay me at Harvard for that. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Alex. Any, I would say an executive order against fracking um, n nationwide, which would which if it was even a democratic uh, president would be unpopular, but you know what, you know what, uh, the, you know, the governor of California, the governor of New York likely aren't gonna become Republicans so they can, so they can go along with it. Um, and then I would think boldly and big and strategically about how the US will, will re-enter the global debate um, and whether that's not just rejoining Paris, but putting a, a different vision together which would catapult off of Paris for more, uh, for more international collaboration and a return to an America which is positively engaged um, in the world. Um, so, you know, I would think of that as an executive action and then, fi and then finally, um, you know, reintroducing America as a player in climate change policy globally. What saith the NRDC? The, well, the two biggest sources of emissions right now for greenhouse gases are cars and power plants. So reinstating uh, the clean power plan, which basically focuses on that sector to try to reduce the carbon emissions from that sector alone. I mean, that, that, the, it's the policies behind basically what Naomi was saying. Um, on the transportation sector, um, again, this administration and members of Congress are walking away from fuel economy standards. These things, the stickers that you see on your car, I mean, who doesn't like not having to pay as much at the pump for a car that drives further um, and longer. Um, those things are under attack. And the reality of the technology of cars, as Elon Musk has, I think, now definitively proven, um, we, we should be moving to a whole electric, uh, electrification of the vehicle um, uh, sector of our society. And that, that's, uh, that's totally doable, right? So how do we both create the regulatory structure through fuel economy standards as well as the incentive structure through rebates or whatnot to electrify um, our vehicles? And, and just so people know, I mean, you can even mention, talk about this. The dream is that we increase renewables that will power the electrification of the cars, because right now the electrification of the cars comes from coal and gas-fired power plants, correct? But that's true, but right. it turns out that even if your car is using electricity from fossil fuels, it's still better to have an electric car because they're so much more efficient than internal combustion engines. Damn it, you're right, Naomi. <laughs>
David Rattray, what do you what, what do you say? What are your two ideas? Uh, well, I'm in with the electric cars and, and infrastructure and rebates specifically for individuals to make it possible to get at them, use them, and charge them on their way to New York City if they're stuck in traffic. I think, you know, solve those problems, um, you, you have a big change quickly. I have a Chevy Volt, by the way, and I love it, and I don't miss all those hours that you spend at a gas pump. It's, I get that time back. I would love to see, uh, the one time Richie Kessel, who was the former uh, head of LIPA, uh, when they were transitioning from, the, uh, from LOCO, he was the head of LOCO, Richard Kessel, and they, transfer, uh, they, they transitioned over to LIPA. And when they did, they gave them a fund that was a renewables fund, uh, that of course they also tucked into the, the, the plan for the conversion, that, that that money could be folded into uh, to pay other expenses. They didn't have to really spend it on renewables, but they had like a $30 million fund to use for renewables on Long Island. And I was with a group of people out here, Christy Brinkley and other people who lived out here were involved with this environmental group, that we said, we want you to use the stuff to mandate uh, uh, some uh, renewables in construction uh, of all public spaces, airports, hospitals, schools, bus stations, trains, anywhere there's a building going that's getting federal dollars, you must have some photovoltaic element in that building on the roof. There's acres and acres of land all around. I mean, we've been out here for a long time now. I haven't been out here as long as you, but arguments about putting wind turbines on Camp Hero. I mean, land that just sits there that could be really, really powering this entire community for the rest of our lives. You know, so I'd like to see the, uh, I don't want to say the Manhattan Project because that bespeaks war. I want to say the Apollo Project of uh, alternative energy where we just, this stuff goes everywhere. You have wind and you have solar. As everywhere you look, you see this stuff generating uh, alternative energy for us. Would you please welcome with me the executive director of Guildhall, Andrea Grover. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. I want to just say how thrilled I am that the Hamptons Institute is back and that it's not going anywhere on my watch. Um, Guildhall was really founded as a gathering place for the community where through the arts we could encourage um, more civic engagement and I think this is a perfect example of our founding mission. Um, I also want to follow that by thanking our sponsors for this evening, Brattering Caloria Foundation, Donna and Carol Janis, Susan and Stephen Jacobson, Alice Netter, the Hayden Family Foundation, of course, the Hilaria and Alec Baldwin Foundation. Thank you so much. Also, we have two more panels coming up. Do you want to talk about those, uh, Alec? We have, um, as we mentioned before, we have the, uh, um, the Trump presidency and the Constitution, Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the Constitution Center, in a conversation with Professor Michael Klarman, the Kirkland and Ellis professor at Harvard Law School. That's next Monday, the 14th. And then uh, uh, Monday the 21st is our last panel, which is uh, the new normal in news, ideology versus fact. And I'm moderating that panel with Amy Goodman from Democracy Now!, Nicholas Lemon, the uh, uh, chairman emeritus of the Columbia Journalism School, and Bob Garfield, the one and only Bob Garfield from NPR's On the Media. Um, would you thank all of our panelists for us? Yes, so I thank you so much, Naomi, Alex, Rhea, David for moderating. Um, also, to let you know, we're installing right now uh, Avedon's America, which is an exhibition that is a perfect complement to this conversation. It's a sort of overview of uh, 20th and 21st century American history through the portraits of Avedon. So we have portraits of civil rights leaders, of women's rights leaders, of major rule breakers and the countercultural figures of our time. So that opens on Saturday. Please come back. Hilton Owls will be speaking here on Saturday. He just won the 2017 Pulitzer in Criticism, along with James Martin of the Avedon Foundation and Bob Rubin, who's an Avedon scholar. That's at 4 o'clock for members on Saturday. So when you're back for the next Hamptons Institute, please visit the galleries for Avedon's America. And thank you so much to our panelists. Have a great night.